<laughs> so uh, yesterday's class we looked at factorial experiments and today we're going to continue on with that theme and, and show really how to estimate the, the name or estimate the effect from the experiment. So what we're going to learn today's class is what you would be able to do pretty much in two, three minutes after you've got your experimental data. And analysis of the data goes really quickly once you have practiced how to do this. So, Let's just uh, quickly recap the system we were looking at from where we were yesterday. This is a company who's operating at this base case over here at the center, at where they've always operated their process, and now they've decided to investigate the directions that they can move the process in to improve their yield. So they're doing this either to improve their yield, to maximize profit, and, and at least initially they're also be doing it just to learn a bit more about the process. So, what they do is they will run a factorial at these four experiments. Uh, so in two factors. So they identify concentration and temperature as their two factors. And we're going to just put down those four corner points there because we've got two factors and two levels. So four combinations there. What I suggest for those of you doing your uh, projects is that you do in fact run that center point first. And so what you'll see today in class is you do not need that center point when you're analyzing data. That center point is unnecessary, but it is helpful. It's a good position to run your first experiment, just to get a feel for how things can operate in the process. So if you're doing a major experiment, for example, Emily mentioned that they, would, they did an initial run. That center point is a great location to do your initial run at but you don't need it, which is why it's a good position to start, because if you mess up that experiment, you can throw the data point out. If you start your experiment with one of these other four corner points and you mess up, you have to repeat that experiment over again. So this company goes and does the four experiments, and we, we said uh, yesterday we spoke a bit about how to set up the table in standard order, so we've got my first factor temperature, that's alternating at the fastest rate, the next factor, substrate concentration, alternates at the next fastest rate. And those are the four data points collected. Now, the nice thing is when we write our experiments in standard order, it's very easy to do a cube. So, if my table is in standard order, when I draw my cube, I write those four numbers down. Bottom left, bottom right, top left, top right and I've joined up those four numbers up. So it's helpful to draw the vertices of your cube as the numbers themselves. And the next step we're going to do where we ended off last class is to estimate what these main effects are. So this is the temperature direction. This was the low level of temperature. This is the high level of temperature. I had the substrate concentration at its low level and its high level. We can always look back at our data to see what those low levels are. So when we tell our operators to run the experiments, we tell them this first experiment we know was run at minus 1.25 grams per liter on the substrate concentration and the run at the low temperature of 338. But for our purposes, we'll always just look at minuses and pluses, and we'll see why uh, towards the end of today's class. That that's a natural way of working with this. So we'll just call it lows and highs, or minuses and pluses. And we ended off by going through preliminary analysis of the data. So let's take a look then at this uh, first effect, the effect of substrate concentration in blue. So it doesn't matter which one you analyze, I can look at temperature, or I can look at substrate concentration, but let's uh, work, work as it is here in the slide. And it may seem redundant that I'm repeating what's on the slide here on the board, but I would encourage you to write it down as well. Just because you, you need to get practice with this, this is something that what's up here should take you about two minutes to do in an exam. And in fact, most experiments that we analyze in the industry, we analyze on paper. That's the great thing about this part of the course, is it's very quick to do without need of going to the computer. So what we say is, let's look at the substrate effect. I'd like to look at the effect of S at high T. So the effect of S at high T is 
I minus O, 53 minus 64, that's equal to minus 11. So the effect of substrate concentration, uh, 53 minus 64, yes, effect of substrate concentration at the high temperature level. So 53 minus 60. Now, this is one way of reporting it. What we will report by default in this course is we report half that size. So, so we simply half those values and we report a 3% decrease per 0.25 gram per liter. Let me just illustrate to you visually on the slide why we do that. The reason is we prefer to consider the difference from our midpoint. So the midpoint is somewhere over here. So it's a quarter gram per liter increase. That will give me a 3% drop per 0.25. So going from the midpoint to there would give me a minus 3%. Also going from the low level to the midpoint it will give me that same minus 3%. So I get a total of minus 6 for that full half gram per liter. But I could, I will, my default frame of reference will be to actually go from the low to the midpoint or from the midpoint to the high level. Okay, you, you'll see why we, we do that um, in, a, in a few minutes towards the end of the class. If we look at the temperature effect, and now I'm looking in this horizontal direction, I go from high to low again, so 53 minus 64 at high substrate concentration gives me a minus 11% decrease, and 69-69 gives me a minus 9% decrease. So on average, a 10% drop per 16 Kelvin. So 16 Kelvin, again, is this range from low to high. I prefer to report that as half the size. So instead of a minus 10% on average decrease, <coughs> let's report that instead as a minus 5% increase per 8 Kelvin. So if I increase from my midpoint temperature up to 354, I will get an 5% a drop in yield, or the same if I go from my low level to the midpoint level, I will also see a minus 5. So it's a total of minus 10 over the full range, or a minus 5 over half the range. Okay, so that half range concept is quite important here. Now, one thing I really like about this section of the course is that you can look at it analytically or algebraically as we've done over here, but we're also going to see that this is a lot of geometric appeal. So let me show you what this surface looks like from a geometric point of view. This point up at the top, or closest to you, you should label point number one in your slides. This is this first experimental data point. So this is point number one two, three, and four in standard order. 
So this is point number one. This point back over here is point number two, which you can label. But this one is a three, and then the one right at the back of the page is four. That's run at the highest temperature and at the highest substrate concentration. So closest to me is one, two is out here all the way to the right, three out here to the left, and four is one furthest back to the page. So what I've shown you there in the grid is the true surface underlying the process. We don't know that actually. All we're measuring really are these four corner points. Those are the only data we really actually have measured. The surface that I've illustrated here is the theoretical surface. We don't know that in practice. Our whole purpose with this section of the course is to approximate what that surface looks like. We're going to build a model that approximates that surface. And what we want to do is we want to build that model by taking the fewest number of experiments. Experiments are expensive. We don't get the opportunity to run them often. So what we want to do is place the location where we choose to run the experiments at the best possible places so that we get the best approximation of that surface. And so today's class is all about how we're going to estimate that surface. So right now we've got these four corner points. That's the true surface. You see a little bit of curvature in there. And I'm going to show you how to estimate that surface. this sort of plot right at the start of the course in the data visualization section. So go back to your notes there later today, tonight, and, and review that. We saw these, these slope plots earlier on. They're a great way to understand what's going on in the process. Let me take a look at this first one over here on the left, and I'll leave the one on the right for you to go try out at home. The one on the left says, let me connect lines that show the effect of temperature. So I'm only looking at the temperature effect right now. And the black line is at one level of substrate constant, and the blue line is at the other substrate. So experiment one up here, experiment two. So I'm investigating the effect here going from 69 down to 60. So as this temperature goes from low to high, I'm seeing a 9 unit decrease in temperature, and this is at the low substrate conditions. The black line is for low substrates, the constant substrates along the black line. The blue line is the upper level. It's going from 64 down to 53. Let's take a look at that back in the context of this original surface plot. At low substrate concentration, so that's this face of this cube, this face that's closest to me, it's basically connecting that point to that point over there with a straight line. So there's a little bit of error. There's a bit of curvature in the theoretical curve. I'm just connecting a straight line with my best approximation. And the surface furthest or into the page is now connecting this point over here, 64 down to 53. So this is experiment number three connected to experiment four. So straight line there. So essentially those two lines are looking at only the temperature effect, looking at it only from this angle, and I'm seeing two lines. One closest to me due to the low substrate, and another line back in the page due to the temperature effect at high substrate. And what I notice there is important. Those lines are roughly parallel. So the effect of temperature is consistent whether I'm at high substrate or at low substrate concentration. It, the effect of temperature is roughly the same. It serves to decrease yield by roughly the same amount. Okay. Now I'll leave you to go investigate the substrate effect later on and it will require you to mentally rotate that cube in your head. Okay, so for those of you that are pretty good at geometrical constructs that way, you'll find that pretty easy to do. But this is the nice thing about the DOE part, whether you can look at things geometrically, you can get it that way, or if you prefer to look at things algebraically, you've got an alternative here, so you're not stuck. So, key point here, the effect of temperature and the effect of substrate can be visualized in this very interesting way, and we can see the effect of temperature is about the same, whether we're at low substrate or high substrate, 
In fact, the substrate is the same whether we're at low temperature or high temperature. So the black line represents constant temperatures, and the blue line represents constant temperatures. Now we're going to take it a step up. Okay, so we're going to build up to more and more complexity as we go through the slides. Now we're going to move our point of reference, and I'm going to show you how things change a little bit if by chance we decide to do our factorial and we're on a ridge. Okay, so here I've got an optimum somewhere over here, kind of like climbing a mountain. I'm climbing it from this angle, and I happen to choose my location so that I'm straddling this ridge. So these two points are kind of curved down. And I'm going to approach this optimum. So there's a, there's a sort of a ridge shape here. This data point is at about 89% yield. This point down here is at 70 something. So 80, it's about 77% yield. This is closer to 80. This is just above 80% yield. So if you can visualize that in your head as a ridge, you're going to understand this next section quite well. Let's take a look at the analysis in the regular, in the regular manner. So there's my four data points. I collect my four experiments at those two temperatures, 390 and 400 Kelvin, so different temperatures to be four, different substrate concentrations to be four. I'm now at half a gram per liter and at 1.25 grams per liter. It's at different levels for T, different levels for X, and I get those four yield values. Estimate for yourselves what the effective temperature is. So as we reported over here, we said something along the lines of the effect of substrate was to decrease yield by 6% per half a gram per liter increase. If I get to do that, same calculation for this setup, and, and repeat it for temperature and repeat it for substrate concentration. Or work with the person next to you, let them do substrate and you do temperature, and then exchange answers. So this should take you no more than three or four minutes. Um, and by the end of this course, you should be doing this in about two minutes. must do is draw that Q plot. Everything in this whole section of the course revolves around those Q plots and visualizing it at least that way.
So let's take a look. Uh, anyone got an effect for temperature? Okay, so let's take a look. We've got some guesses here or some estimates. The first thing to do is draw the Q plot, which I've done up over here. So the experiments in standard order are, are shown. One thing that's also helpful is to sometimes write the deltas between the vertices on your plot. Though for when we get to three-dimensional plots, that starts to get messy. When we run 2D, this is a great, uh, a great way to help you. So the first thing we look at is the effect of temperature, then we'll look at substrate after. The effect of temperature at high substrate, so at the upper level of substrate, is to increase yield. So when we go from low temperature to high temperature, our yield goes up in this particular example, from 81 to 89. So we can write then 89 minus 81 is equal to plus 8 at high substrate. At low substrate, that difference is 79 minus 77 is a 2 unit increase. Okay, so here's where you're starting to notice some of the what happens when we're on a ridge. When we're on a ridge, these individual estimates start to differ quite substantially from each other. In this example, we had these numbers over here being fairly close together. This time they're not. So when we report the average, the average is plus five units. Five units per, we've gone from 0.5 to 1.25, so we're per 0.75 grams per liter. Sorry? Uh, okay, sir. Per 10 million. Average is 5 yes, per 10 million. Okay, we report half of that. So report 2.5 per 5 kelvin. So 2.5 percent per 5 kelvin. That's how we would write the main effect of temperature. If we look at substrates effect, so now we're looking at the effect of going from low substrate to high substrate. We're looking at two estimates of that. We've got an estimate at high temperature and an estimate at low temperature. So I'll just uh, go here to the next slide and show you how we look at that. So we could say the effect of substrate is delta S at high temperature. So we use this symbology to help us speed it up. So the effect of substrate at high temperature, T plus, is equal to 10%. So going from 79 to 89. The effect of substrate at low temperature is a 4% increase from 77 to 81 per 0.75 grams per liter change. The average of that, 10 plus 4 is 14, divide 2 is 7%. But we report this as, so if you add this to your slides, please. We report this as 3.5% per 0.375 grams per liter. Okay, so these two. Uh, parts in the boxes over here, add these to your slides. So even though we write this as 5% to 10 Kelvin, that's over the full range. We report over the half range. So our main effects are reported over the half range. So in this case, you have two variables with two possible outcomes, I guess. So you have eight different combinations of things. Um, Oh, sorry, four experiments that you can test everything. Yeah. But what if you have like you know, 32 different experiments? Do you have to run all 32 tests to get a point like that to see where you So 32 experiments means you've got five variables, five factors. You can't draw a five-dimensional cube. That's why we're going, what I'm going to do here then is how we do this in a computerized way afterwards. So we're going to start simple and show you how this goes to, over to these squares. And then when you can do it in these ways, then you can do it for arbitrary number of Well, what I was just trying to say is that 
do you experiment and then calculate and experiment again? Or do you do all your experiments at one time? Oh, I see what you said. Okay, no. You see what you generally do is you do your experiments and you calculate as soon as you can. Because it's like any good experiment, you want to be able to recognize that you're messing up. You don't want to wait till the end to figure it out. What if you figure out at the end that most of your variables have no effect? Like if you could have figured that out earlier on, you would have stopped your experiments. It's the same like drug trials. So sometimes they'll stop drug trials early because they're recognizing the drug works so well. So they stop or they recognize they're killing them. So let's stop early. So the same thing in chemical processes. You try to analyze the data as soon as possible. That's why I want you to learn this method that we're doing up here on the board. Because while you're in the chemical plant, you're running a trial, you're analyzing your data right away. So I was co-supervising well, supervising a student a few years ago working at PepsiCo Foods. And that is exactly what she was doing. She was measuring and right away calculating her results so that she could run the next experiment without going back to the lab, dressing, undressing with the gown and the hoods and the protective clothing. So you really want to be able to do this really quickly. Also, you have to do it in a test room exactly. <laughs> Okay, so let's visualize those data we just uh, looked at there. And this time, if we draw the same plot, an interaction plot, we see that our lines are not parallel. So I, you, can, you should be able to construct these, these plots for yourselves based on these data over here. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of time to do this. And the key issue is that the lines are not parallel. So the effect of temperature at low substrate and the effect of temperature at high substrate is quite different. Notice that at low substrate concentration, that's the black line, and at high substrate concentration, the effect is enhanced. Okay, so the key thing is here, when we have interactions, is that the other variable that should be held, that is being held constant, has an interaction with the variable we're changing. And there's a synergistic effect. If I keep temperature low, I get an increase. Oh, sorry, if I keep substrate low, I get an increase when I go from low temperature to high temperature. But if substrate concentration is also high, and I make that same increase in temperature, I'm getting an even greater effect. And so it's a, there's a synergy going on here between temperature and substrate. This is always the case when we're operating on a ridge. And in many chemical processes, this is the reality of where we are. And as you would expect, any optimum, by definition, to get up to the optimum means you must have moved up to the optimum along some form of ridge or some sort of nonlinear shape. So you will always see this when you approach an optimum. If you're far away from the optimum, your surface may actually be quite linear and smooth. But the moment you start to approach an optimum, you will start to see interaction effects. And that's why we must understand it and, and understand how to interpret it visually and geometrically. Okay, so here we can see that the effect of temperature is to increase yield for both situations, but that increase is magnified when we're at high substrate concentration. If we look at substrate concentration's effect, it also will increase yield. So both slopes go upwards. So I know that both, both um, at both instances, substrate concentration has a positive effect on yield. But when I'm at high temperature, that effect is magnified. Okay, so it's a symmetrical. Interactions are always symmetrical. When I talk about the interaction between temperature and substrate, I could just as well talk about the interaction between substrate and temperature. It's the same thing. Okay, so we call this the TS interaction or the ST interaction. It doesn't matter which way you call it. It's also what we will call in this uh, next few classes, we'll start to see this terminology coming up quite frequently. It's called a two-factor interaction. There's two factors interacting with each other. Okay, so if we go back to our system with no interaction, the key issue, the key difference I should say, is that when we estimated the two effects of temperature, one at low substrate and high substrate, those numbers numerically were close to each other. And the same for the substrate effect was numerically close to each other at low and high temperatures. That's how we can tell there's no interaction in that system. 
but uh, for the system where there is substantial interaction, those two numbers differ. So if we go back here, there's a substantial difference between 8 versus 2 and 10 versus 1. <laughs> So you could imagine then, uh, whereas in the previous case we, we take the average of those and we report the average. If I take the average of these, it's really the average isn't true for either case. It's a middle approximation of it, but it's not totally capturing that effect. And same here, the average isn't really capturing that effect. So what we need is to add to our model an interaction term that accounts for that. And we're going to see that now coming up in the next session. So here's how we estimate the interaction effect. Let's go back. So the change in yield due to temperature at high substrate was plus 8. And the change in yield due to temperature at low substrate was plus 2. That's what's up on the board here. And what you, you wrote down earlier. The interaction, how do we report the interaction? The interaction is half of the difference between the high value and the low value. So 8 half of the difference from high to low, 8 minus 2, and then we report it as half of that. So the interaction is reported as 6 divided by 2 is 3. Okay, so you can repeat that calculation for the ST interaction. Here I looked at the T interaction with S, but if I look at the S interaction with T, the change in Y due to substrate at high temperature was 10 units. The change in yield due to substrate, going so from, from high to low substrate at low temperature was 4 units. Half the difference between 10 to 4, 10 minus 4 is 6, divided by 2 is 3. You'll always get the same answer. That's why interactions are symmetrical. Same value, it doesn't matter which way around you look at it. Okay, we've seen an interaction here that's synergistic. When you're operating at high temperature and at high substrate, you serve to increase your yields. Let's just look at that visually, back, right back at the beginning where I had it superimposed on the theoretical plot. So here at the, if I serve to, if I increase temperature, my yield will increase. So from low temperature to high temperature, in both instances, yield increases. Going from low substrate to high substrate, yield increases, but because we're on the ridge, we've got this diagonal issue going on, we get a synergistic effect here, so that effect is enhanced when I'm both at high temperature and at high substrate. There are instances where the synergies cancel each other out. Here the synergy, synergies are complementing each other and augmenting it. There are ridges that you can construct where those cancel out. Okay, so We'll see some of that coming up in one or two of the examples later on. So for now, our interaction is working in our favor. If I wanted to increase yield, it's telling me to increase both substrate and temperature, and I'm going to further augment it because there's an interaction term. So the interaction terms work in my favor in this particular case. Okay, now let's go look at how we analyze these data in a least squares model. To do that, let's go back to this earlier example. It was a little simpler, so we'll introduce the concept there, and then we'll come back to the, this example with interaction uh, to try out. So let's go back to the simple case where I had my base line at the midpoint, and I had low temperature, high temperature, low temperature, high temperature, low substrate, high substrate, and those were the four yield values I had. This is how we do it to analyze the, the model in these squares. It's called standard form, and this equation over here is, should be very comfortable for you. You've seen this when we've created z values. When we've created z values, we say take our variable minus the center and divide through by some sort of range or standard deviation. We're doing exactly the same thing here. Take my variable's value minus the center point, which is the baseline in this case, and divide through by half the range. Let's take a look at what we get. We apply that to each of the four rows in my table. So the first experiment was run at 338 Kelvin, minus the center point, which is at 346 Kelvin. That's a minus 8 in the numerator. 
on top of the range, the range, the total range that I ran my experiment at was 16 Kelvin, so half of 16 is 8. Minus 8 over 8 gives me a minus 1. The second row was run at high temperature. So 354 minus 346. 354 minus 346 is plus 8. Divided by half the range of 8 gives me a plus 1. So that's why we use minuses and pluses. You might as well just write there minus one plus one, minus one plus one. All we're doing is we're creating coded variables for our raw data. And the reason is every experiment is going to be run at different, um, different conditions. So here's one particular experiment. Then you're going to go home and run your own experiments. Every time you use different values, to make analysis easier, it's great if we can bring all our raw data to some unified framework. That unified framework is given by standard form. Take the raw data minus some form of mean, which is the center point, divide it through by some sort of standard deviation. In this case, half the range which you operated over, so half the spread, and that will create a normalized variable. And the normalized variables will have the coordinates where this corresponds to minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. So you'll get a minus one here for temperature, a minus one for substrate. For that point, this point will be at plus one for temperature, minus one for substrate. This point at the top here will be at minus one for temperature, plus one for substrate. This point will be at plus one, plus one. So I'm always writing TSS. So that coding or standard form you apply to both your variables, you apply to the temperature and you apply to the substrate. I've shown you the detailed calculations here, but you would never do that. Right? We always will get in practice that if you ran your experiment at the intended low level and at the high level, you can just simply go ahead and write minus ones and plus ones in the correct space. Is everyone clear on how that coding of minus ones and plus ones come about? Okay, this is important to, uh, to understand. So if you don't understand it, make sure you get it after the class of the last week. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move and analyze the, the model using least squares. So we're going to build a least squares model that fits that data. And we're going to fit a least squares model which has an intercept, V0. It's going to have a term that accounts for the temperature effect, Vt. It's going to have a term that accounts for the substrate effect, Vs. Yes, coming up. And then a term that accounts for the interaction, Vts. So it's the product of temperature multiplied by substrate. It's an interaction of temperature and substrate. We'll call that term Vts. Four parameters, V0, Vt, Vs, Vts, four data points. I can estimate four parameters from four data points. But that's going to leave me no degrees of freedom. Okay, so it's the same idea. If you fit a straight line with two data points, you've got no degrees of freedom to estimate how well the straight line is fit. It's going to fit the data perfect. Same thing here with the least squares model. I'm estimating four parameters for four data points. I'm not going to be able to estimate confidence points afterwards for those four parameters. The reason is four data points will fit that linear model perfectly. There will be no standard error. R squared will be one. There will be no way to estimate confidence points. Okay, but remember, this is what we want to do. We want to calculate the least number of uh, do the least number of experiments to get the most value. The fact that we want to do the least number of experiments forces us into a situation where we won't be able to do things that we like to do, which are estimate standard errors and estimate confidence intervals. In fact, the only way we can estimate confidence intervals is if we do replicate experiments. But replicates now mean we have to go do extra work. Okay, so it's always a trade-off, and you'll see this coming up over the next few classes. I'll show you how uh, we can trade things off and actually get some degrees of freedom to come back to us. Okay, so we will be able to estimate confidence intervals later on. Just right now, when we've got the minimum number of data points to estimate these four parameters, we're constrained to 
no, to no confidence intervals. So here's what we do. That's my least squares model. I write out <coughs> the least squares model for every experiment. So I have four experiments. I can write out the least squares model four times. So here I've given you an example for the first one. This is not in your slide, so add this to your notes. For the first experiment, I ran the first experiment at low temperature and at low substrate. So low T, low S. I'll call that T minus and S minus. So first I record the yield at the first experiment. I know what Y1 is. That's the yield from the first experiment. Is equal to B0 the slope. Oh, sorry, the intercept, I should say. B0 is the intercept. We're going to estimate that. I want to estimate the effect of temperature, Bt, multiplied by the value of temperature, so T minus plus the slope for the, for the substrate, multiplied by the value which I ran the substrate at, so the low level of substrate in the first experiment. Then an interaction term, Bts, so the low level of temperature multiplied by the low level of substrate. I can repeat that for the second experiment, the third experiment, and the fourth experiment. And I'll stack up those four linear equations into a matrix form. When I stack four equations up, I can write a vector for y. So these are my four yield values in standard order. I just copy them down out of my table in standard order. Okay, this is why that standard order table is so important. When you set it up right the first time, Building your least squares model afterwards simply means you just copy that table out into R and you, you can let it go and build the model for you. So Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, these are written in the order that is in standard order of the table. The first column in your matrix is always going to be a column of ones because it corresponds to the intercept. So, so 1 times B0 gives me my B0 back over there. The second <laughs> column corresponds to the temperature effect. And notice here that it's simply minus plus minus plus, exactly in the same order from the standard order table. The third column corresponds to the slope coefficient, Vs. It's minus minus plus plus, again from the standard order table. Then the, third, the final column is the effect of interaction between temperature and substrate. Now notice here, all you do is you take the product of the two columns that it's the interaction for. This is the interaction for temperature and substrate. So multiply the temperature column by the substrate column. Minus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, plus. Okay, so every entry in this X matrix is very easy to get. The first column is always a column of ones. The second column is the column corresponding to the temperature from the standard table. The S column corresponds to the S column from the standard table. And the TS interaction is simply the product of the T column and the S column. So if you just skip over a slide, I'll come back to that geometric picture in a second. If you skip over a slide here, I've converted that into numerical values. So T minus, that's the temperature at the low level, we'll substitute the coded value for that. So it's minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. For the S column, minus, minus, plus, plus, and then the last column is the temperature substrate interaction with the product. So minus one times minus one is plus one, plus one times minus one is minus one, minus times plus is minus, plus, plus, plus. So I, I've just written up here what I said there just a second ago. So you can choose to copy this down or this, um, download the new notes off the website. But essentially it's saying that this intercept column is always a column of ones. This column is from the standard table. The second, the third column is from the standard table. And the final column is the product of the chocolate to the Okay, so you can start to see where this is going. I've got a y vector. I've got an X matrix. The moment we have that, we can go calculate my linear model as B is equal to X transpose X inverse 
x transpose y. And that's going to estimate for me in one go the four values in this B column. So I'll get all four estimates of those slope coefficients in one go. Get the intercept of zero, an estimate of the, of the temperature effect, an estimate of the slope effect, and then an estimate of the heat effect. Okay, so this is why those multiple linear regression assignment questions go down on the test is so good. You must understand that this equation is due to the temperature because it's now really the way you want to solve these problems. What I do want to just quickly talk about is what that linear model looks like. So we, we should always be able to visualize what our data models look like. Here I've shown what the least squares model is in the form of x of the no interaction. So, oh, no, sorry, no, so this, this illustration is just a straight but let's take a look at what we're doing. This axis over here, one point along from the left to right, is the first factor. So let's just call this x1. The, the second axis running in and out of the page is x2. It's the second factor. And this red point over here corresponds to the experiment you run at the low level of x1 and at the low level of x2. High low, so high x1, low x2. This point over here is low high, so low level of the first variable, high level of the second variable, and that point over there is the high high. Okay, so I've got these four corner points, those are the only four y values I have. When I run my experiments, I only have those four y's. I'm going to fit that plane to pass exactly through those data points. Four parameters need to be estimated from four data points. There's going to be no residual error. So the sum of squares of the residuals is going to be zero. That implies those corner points lie exactly on the plane with no residual error. B0 represents my intercept. It's the intercept when x1 is zero and x2 is zero. So notice that this coding that we've chosen is quite convenient. The coding goes from minus 1 to plus 1. <coughs> so there's my full range. Half the range goes from minus 1 to 0 or from 0 to plus 1. That's why we chose the half range. And that's why when I said report, report things, we're always going to report it half of the the range. So initially I saw that it was an average change of 5 units per full range of 10 Kelvin. We're going to rather report the half range. And the reason is because we're going to build least squares models. And least squares model slope coefficients tell you the effect of the slope is the change when you change that x variable by one unit. Okay. So one unit change is to go from the midpoint to plus one. If I had reported it as the change from minus 1 to plus 1, that's a 2 units change. And so the slope coefficient will be back. So we will build our models with least squares, so we will prefer to use the range that we have to the half the range. Okay, so very important to have this geometric picture of what that least squares model is doing. The four corner points spanning the space, the intercept is right here at the zero, zero point at the midpoint of the plane. And that d squares model applies everywhere. I can apply it not only at the corner points, but in between it's also that. So that's what the y hat is going to So I can use that model later on to predict all of the other points any other point around the negative. So we'll take that into consideration.